So, Daniel chapter 6, and we're going to read from verse 10 to the end of the chapter. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any god or man except to you, O king, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, The decree stands in accordance with the laws of the Medes and Persians which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men went as a group to the king and said to him, Remember, O king, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me, because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I ever done any wrong before you, O king. The king was overjoyed, and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den, along with their wives and their children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations and men of every language throughout the land, May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. The book of Daniel was written for people just like us. People who find themselves on the front line of a conflict. A ferocious conflict that has waged for centuries. It's the conflict between the kingdom of Jesus Christ and the kingdoms of this world. And sometimes whenever we're on the front lines, we can get discouraged, we can get frightened, and we can be tempted to retreat back into our shells. And so this book is designed to encourage us. It reminds us again and again and again that we are on the winning side. It reminds us that no matter how powerful Christ's enemies may be, no matter how devious or how cunning or how determined they may be, it reminds us the kingdom of Christ always wins. 
And ultimately, that's what this book is about. And it's what chapter six is about. Now, as we come to look at this story in Daniel chapter six, I have a question to ask. But before I ask this question, I I do want to take us on a little bit of a diversion. Now, some of you will know the movie Die Hard. You know, as far as I'm concerned, Die Hard is the most Christmassy movie that there's possible to be. But but anyway, Die Hard was so popular whenever it came out, and it was so influential that ever since then, it's felt like there's been this conveyor belt almost of movies that basically rip it off. And sometimes these rip-offs are so blatant that the producers don't even bother trying to hide it. So they'll describe their movie as Die Hard on a Boat or Die Hard on a Plane. In fact, there's even a joke about one guy who tried pitching a movie and he described it as Die Hard in an office building. Now, you can Google it later if, if you don't understand why that's so funny, but critics can be really dismissive of those movies. And they say, do we really need this? Do we really need another movie which has baddies with foreign accents? Do we really need another undercover cop who's going to start shooting the bad guys up? These movies, they don't bring anything new, the critics say. They're just rehashing the same old story. There's no point. And that diversion brings me to my question. My question is, what is the point of Daniel chapter 6? Because it looks like the same basic story as Daniel chapter 3, doesn't it? Daniel chapter 3, you've got Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Daniel chapter 6, you've got Daniel himself. Daniel chapter 3, they're outnumbered. Daniel chapter 6, he's outnumbered. Daniel 3, the king commands them to worship an idol. Chapter 6, the king commands Daniel not to pray. Chapter 3, if they don't do as they're told, they'll be thrown into the fiery furnace. Chapter 6, if Daniel doesn't do as he's told, he'll be thrown into the lion's den. Chapter 3, God does a miracle and he saves his people. Chapter 6, God does a miracle and he saves his follower. What's the point? What does Daniel chapter 6 actually bring to the table? Why do we need both Daniel chapter 3 and Daniel chapter 6? Well, the most obvious reason why we're given both is because both actually happened. And God is simply reporting for us the events that took place. But I think as well as that, there is another, perhaps more fundamental reason why we have both of these stories. I think the very fact that these stories are so repetitive actually helps to hammer home the basic points. You see, this chapter, chapter 6, it helps us to look at the world around us in a proper perspective. And the fact that we've already had chapter 3 means that it gets its point home with even more force. And this evening, there are three principles that I want us to see. The first principle, the world hates you. Now, I don't want to be overly dramatic here. We're not being dragged away to gulags. The secret police aren't kicking down our doors. We're not being burnt at the stake. The last thing I want to do is to over-egg the pudding. There are, of course, plenty of Christians across the world who are being beaten up and they are being murdered for their faith. But that's not us. We live safe, comfortable lives. And yet, having said that, this is a biblical principle. The world hates you. And I think by giving us this story so soon after chapter 3, God is showing us there are some things that change and there are some things that never change. You know, whenever you think about it, a lot has changed from chapter 3. The Babylonian Empire has completely crumbled. The Persian Empire, which was nothing back in chapter 3, it is now the most powerful country in the whole world. The ruler has changed. Darius is a very different person from Nebuchadnezzar. He's far more genial. He's far more reasonable. Things have changed for the main character. 
Daniel is one of the most prominent men in the entire country. And yet, there's something that hasn't changed. And that is the hatred of Christ's enemies. You see, in both of these chapters, we have God's people living out their faith. And in both of these chapters, there is something about that that offends people. In chapter 6, it's Daniel's integrity. He shows up these other civil servants. He, He maybe makes it impossible for them to fill their pockets. And Daniel 6 and Daniel 3, we have the same thing happening, don't we? We have the same dilemma. If Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were to just bow down to this idol, or if Daniel was just to turn a blind eye, if they were to compromise on their faith, they wouldn't have any problems whatsoever. In both these chapters, the only reason they ended up in the crosshairs is because they put God first. And that's a theme that doesn't simply run through the book of Daniel, it runs throughout the whole Bible. Do you remember what Jesus said to his disciples in John chapter 15? The world hates you. Keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. That's why those same disciples Jesus was speaking to were persecuted after his death. That is why they were beaten up. That is why they were locked up. That is why they were even murdered for their faith. Because the world hates them. That's why the Scottish Covenanters were hounded by the king's men. Because they dared to worship in the way that Jesus Christ commanded. The world hates them. That is why Christians in some countries today, they're sent to the labour camp if they dare to share the gospel. The world hates them. And that is why, let's face it, in the western, civilised world today, you do sometimes hear of witch hunts whenever a Christian has the temerity to say the wrong thing. The world hates you. And by giving us chapter 3 And chapter 6, God shows us that even though time marches on, even though the people and the places and the kingdoms change, the principle stays the same. The world hates you. And I want to take this principle and I want to apply it in four different ways. So first of all, don't be alarmed. You know, a lot of Christians have been really badly shaken by the laws that have been changed in Ireland over the last five years or so. And some of those Christians have said to me, you know, this isn't the same Ireland that I grew up in. And and look, I know what they mean by that. And I sympathise with what they say. But actually, it is the same Ireland. Ireland and many other countries as well, have always hated Jesus Christ. The kingdoms of this world have always felt threatened by the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Now, you may think I'm being melodramatic about that, but let me explain myself. Our society loves Jesus. Or, to put it in a more accurate way, it loves a certain image of Jesus. It loves that gentle, mild guy, the guy who stays in the background until you need him or until you're in a tight spot. But it has always been different when society has been confronted with the real Jesus. People are more than happy for the church to play its part. They're more than happy to allow the church to do funerals and weddings and baptisms. That's great. No problem. But what happens the second that the church dares to proclaim what Jesus Christ has to say? What happens when the church weighs in with the word of Christ on those hot ethical topics of the day? What are we told? The church has no right to interfere in public life. Christians have no right to tell other people what to do. And yes, A huge amount has changed over the last number of years. I'm sure a huge amount is going to change in the years to come. But fundamentally, nothing has changed. 
The world has always hated us because the world has always hated the real offensive Jesus. And really, over the last number of years, all we've actually seen is that hatred coming out from under the surface and coming out into the open. And so as you see the world seemingly changing around you, don't be alarmed. God tells us this is the way it has always been. Second way in which I'd like to apply this principle, you don't need to fit in. I want to speak especially to our teenagers at this point. I know what it's like. It's not that long ago I was a teenager as well. You want to fit in. You don't want to be different from everybody else. You don't want to be the weirdo who who creeps other people out. I know that. And I know that especially if you leave home and say you go away for university, I know that it is especially difficult. I know it's a constant temptation to go the same places as everyone else, to dress the same way as everyone, to act the same way as everyone, because you don't want to stand out. But you need to know this. If you take your faith seriously, you will stand out. Now, I am not saying you should go out of your way to stand out. What I am saying, though, is that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, the world will hate you. You will have classmates who think you're a killjoy. You will have roommates who think you're wasting your life. I mean, by all means, make friends. By all means, try to fit in. Those are all good things to do, but don't obsess over it. Don't try to dress yourself up according to the world's terms. Because one of two things will happen. Either you will end up compromising to fit in, or you won't compromise and it just won't work. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, the world hates you. Third way in which I'd like to apply this principle, I want to ask a question. If the world hates you, Why? Let's be fair, there are some Christians and they are utterly obnoxious. They pick fights. They make other people feel about this high. And then, whenever people start to criticise them, what do they do? They pat themselves on the back and they say, I'm being persecuted, so I must be doing something right. Well, remember the story of Daniel. These enemies tried their very best to find some fault in him so that they could get him into trouble, and they couldn't. He was respectful, he was hard-working, he was honest. And so they had to manufacture some sort of, of some sort of crisis, some sort of trap in order to get what they wanted. And if you have faced some sort of hostility because of your Christian faith, I think it's right to ask the question, is that hostility because people hate Jesus? Or is it because you've made a nuisance of yourself? We have to ask. The fourth way in which I'd like to apply this principle, it's another question, but it's slightly different this time. If the world doesn't hate you, why not? You know, one of the things that I'm very thankful for is how our members are so well thought of in their communities. I think that's great. It's wonderful that you couldn't find a single person who would have a bad word to say about many of our members. That's great. And so what I'm about to say, it's not a hard and fast rule, but it is food for thought. If people don't feel threatened by your honesty and your consistency, If there isn't something about your way of living that shines the spotlight on other people and shows up their emptiness. If people don't feel in some way uncomfortable because of your way of life. Could it be that you're hiding who you really are? Could it be that your allegiance to Jesus Christ is not on display in the way it ought to be? 
Maybe. Maybe not. It's worth thinking about though. All I know is, Daniel didn't go looking for hatred, but hatred came looking for Daniel. If the world doesn't hate you, why not? So the first lesson we see this evening, the world hates you. Second lesson, and this one's more brief, the world can't save you. Or to put it another way, the world will let you down. Now, we've seen the story. These enemies of Daniel, they come up with this trap. They convince Darius to pass this law. The law says that nobody is to pray to any god or any man for 30 days except to Darius himself. Daniel hears about this law. He decides he's going to pray to the true god anyway. And, unsurprisingly, Daniel gets caught. The punishment is that he is to be thrown into this lion's den. These hungry, vicious, angry lions are going to rip him to shreds. He's absolutely doomed. Sounds very like chapter 3, doesn't it? But there is one big difference. The big difference is that in chapter 3, whenever Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were about to be thrown into the fiery furnace, Nebuchadnezzar was not a man who would have thought twice about doing that. Darius was different. Darius really, really valued Daniel. Darius wanted to make Daniel his right-hand man. Darius seemed to have a certain amount of affection for Daniel. And that comes through in the story. Darius bitterly regretted what he'd done. He'd got carried away by emotion. He had allowed flattery to cloud his judgment. And he'd passed this law without thinking about the potential consequences. I'm sure... Darius never expected that this would be the end result. And notice what he does when he hears that according to the law, Daniel is to be thrown to the lions. Verse 14. He was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and he made every effort until sundown to save him. I mean, you would think surely Daniel's going to be okay. Surely this man, who is the most powerful man in Babylon, surely he's going to find a way to save Daniel's life. Surely these enemies will have no choice but to give it up. Daniel's going to go free. Well, you'd be wrong. Verse 15. Then the men went as a group to the king and said to him, Remember, O king, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, No decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. Darius is beaten by this. And so he gives the word in verse 16. Daniel is flung into the lion's den and he's left to his fate. And what I'll say is this. If Daniel's hope for deliverance lay in the might or the persuasiveness of Darius... He would have been crushed by what just happened. Thankfully, it wasn't. Daniel's hope lay elsewhere. And I think there's a a very important lesson in that for Christians. Let me take one application of it. What about politics? How often do you see Christians and they get really, really passionately excited about a particular political candidate? And I don't necessarily mean a Christian politician. I just mean a politician who takes the same stance on certain issues. And they get really, really fired up. And they tell us how committed that politician is or how committed that party is to this cause. They get excited about how dynamic he is as a speaker, how persuasive he is. They tell us this is going to be the most important election that there's ever been and if we don't pick the right candidate, if we don't pick someone who thinks the right way about these issues, then it's going to be a disaster. Now, for obvious reasons, I don't want to mention particular parties, I don't want to mention particular people, But it is something that I've seen many times in many countries. Christians begin to pin their hopes on particular politicians. 
Well, this chapter is telling us if we do that, if we pin all of our hopes on one particular person, even if he is the most charismatic, most tenacious, most energetic, most gifted person that the world has ever seen, even if he has pledged himself to do the right thing when it comes to all of these key issues, if we do that, we're setting ourselves up for a fall. If there was anyone who could get the job done, it was Darius. And yet, Darius let Daniel down. Or at least he would have let Daniel down if Daniel had been trusting in him. Darius, for all of his power, all of his prestige, all of his persuasiveness, could do nothing to save Daniel's life. I suppose there's an obvious application, isn't there, whenever it comes to COVID-19. We give thanks to God for the leaders he's given us. We give thanks for the expertise that he's given to researchers. We give thanks for the tirelessness of our medical staff. But we don't trust in them. We trust them in that they are given to us by God, but our ultimate hope is not in these men and women. And if our ultimate hope is in these men and women, well then we're setting ourselves up for a fall. The world can't save you. You need to look to the one who can. So we've seen the world hate you, the world can't save you. The third and final principle we see this evening, the world has been overcome. Try as he might, Darius just could not save Daniel. So Daniel is taken, he is flung into the lion's den in verse 17, and then a stone is brought. This stone is placed over the mouth of the den, and so there is no way out. Now, I do wonder, those of you who have children, I wonder if you are maybe at a wee bit of a disadvantage here. Because if you have a kid's Bible which has pictures and it has this story, there's probably a fair chance that the lions have been disney um, They certainly weren't cute and cuddly in real life. You need to imagine what this would have been like. Imagine the razor sharp claws. Imagine the piercing teeth. Imagine these hungry beasts and they're angry and they're growling and they're salivating every time someone throws in a sack of meat. And of course Daniel is just a sack of meat to these lions isn't he? Imagine how they pounce. Imagine how they rip. Imagine how they shred and they snap and they destroy. These are fearsome creatures. Daniel doesn't stand a chance. And Darius, he's distraught because Daniel is his most trustworthy advisor. And he knows that he's doomed. And so Darius can't sleep. And first thing in the morning, the very first thing he does is he goes running to this den of lions and he hopes against hope and he calls out in verse 20, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from the lions? And you can imagine Darius' heart, it feels like it's about to pound out of his chest, but he hears the answer. Verse 22, my God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. And again, I wonder if if maybe children's story Bibles do us a bit of a disservice here. You, you don't want to imagine this angel as being all cutesy, witsy, like so many pictures of angels are. The angels were fearsome warriors. A pack of ferocious lions, even with their teeth and even with their claws, would be no match for someone so awesome. And God has sent this heavenly warrior to save Daniel's life. God has demonstrated there is someone who is greater than Darius. Daniel may have been found guilty in the court of Darius, but that doesn't matter because verse 22, he has been found innocent in the court of heaven. So Daniel, he's, he's lifted out of this den. Darius is 
angry with these men who have manufactured this plot against Daniel. And so in verse 24, he gets his revenge. He takes them. He takes their whole families, in fact. And by the way, you don't have to like this. But it is what happened. And Darius throws these men and their families to the same lions. This time, of course, there is no fearsome angel standing guard. Verse 24 Before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. And then Darius, having seen God's incredible work, he gives this testimony to the people. He repeats this message that we've seen repeated throughout this book. God's kingdom will not be destroyed and his dominion will never end. And that is the key truth that God wants you to know. Yes, the world hates you. Yes, it's suspicion and it's hostility. They can get you down. Yes, it it sucks to be slagged off on radio phone-ins, doesn't it? Yes, our country has rebelled against the King of Kings. Yes, there are Christians all across the world who are being martyred because of their faith. But fundamentally, that doesn't change anything. Because Jesus Christ is still on the throne. Do you remember chapter 2? We saw in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, there was this statue. It's a different statue from chapter 3, but this statue, it pictured the most glorious kingdoms in the world. And what happened to this majestic statue? It was smashed into pieces by this tiny rock. And do you remember what happened to the rock? The rock grew and grew and grew and it became a mountain and it filled the whole earth. And we thought about how that rock was a picture of Jesus Christ himself. Well, that's the truth that you need to remember. Just before Jesus told his disciples that the world hates them, he told them this. I have overcome the world. He was looking forward to the day when he would go to the cross. And by going to the cross, he would win the victory against his enemies once and for all. So yes, we have troubles to face. Yes, this world stands in rebellion against Jesus Christ. Yes, the world hates us. Yes, it misrepresents us. Yes, there is nobody we can trust to give us victory over the world. But the fact remains, we're on the winning side. Because Christ himself has overcome the world. And at the end of the day, the verdict that matters is not the verdict of Darius's courtroom. It's not the verdict of your friends or your neighbours. It's not the verdict of the panellists on the radio. It's not the verdict of the newspapers. It's not the verdict of the internet message boards. It's the verdict of Jesus Christ. The king whose kingdom rules forever. And if you are a follower of Jesus, he encourages you to look to the day when he comes back in glory. Look to the day when he announces his verdict. Look to the day when he vindicates you, just as he vindicated Daniel. Jesus Christ says to you this evening, Take heart. I have overcome the world.